Perfect. So yes, uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Chris Norm. I'm a technical sales specialist uh, here for ITM Instruments. Thank you for joining our webinar today uh, presented by ITM University. Today's topic is the fundamentals of power monitoring hosted and presented by Dranitz. Uh, we're going to kindly ask you to mute your mic microphone throughout the presentation. It should be about 40 to 45 minutes, and we've uh, allotted some time at the end for Q&A. Um, throughout the presentation, we are going to encourage you to use the chat feature and use the question feature to submit any and all questions that you uh, that you may have. And we'll break in between if you do have questions that are pertinent to the slide that Ross is going over at the, at the moment of your question. We'll stop mid-presentation as well, but we also have that allotted time at the end. Uh, ITM Instruments has been working very closely with Dranitz for many years. We pride ourselves on being a leading distributor of Dranitz. This is a result of our dedication to offering you our product expertise, our service, and competitive pricing. Getting started today, uh, the presentation is presented, pre pardon me, <laughs> presented by Ross Egnall uh, from Dranitz. Ross graduated from Trenton State with a BS in electronics and a minor in computer science. Ross has over 25 years of experience in the design, development, development, marketing, and application of test and measurement instrumentation. Ross has worked in various capacities in engineering, sales, marketing, and is presently the Director of Product Management, Marketing, and Technical Support at Dranitz Technologies. Ross is a member of the IEC US National Committee and a technical expert and US representative to IEC TC77, SC77A, WG9. Uh, Ross is a US patent holder and is a frequent domestic and international speaker, conducting seminars, presenting papers and articles in the fields of instrumentation, power quality, energy, and demand. Ross, the presentation is over to you. All right, thank you, Chris. Um, thanks again, we do appreciate ITM's time today. Um, I know it's hard putting together these presentations. Uh, we do a lot of them. So um, today we're gonna talk about the fundamentals of power monitoring. Um, we're gonna take you through the basics. In fact, we'll just go to the agenda here. Uh, we're gonna do an introduction to power monitoring, uh, what it is, what we're measuring. Um, power monitoring could be considered a little bit different than some of the other types of monitoring people may do. So we're gonna kind of define what we're talking about. Um, we're gonna talk about how we're doing some basic measurements, uh, what we're measuring, uh, transducer considerations, different things like that. Um, then we're gonna actually break out into two or three different sections, um, focusing on what power monitoring is. What's the difference between power, power quality? Um, they are very similar, but different. So we're gonna tell you some of the differences and focus on them in two different sections. Then. Related to har uh, power quality, we're gonna speak about harmonics. Uh, what are harmonics? What are the concerns? And throughout this entire presentation, we'll talk about some of the standards involved um, that we should be following. I know uh, Canada you know, may be a hybrid of some of the IEEE and some of the international standards or IEC standards. So uh, maybe we'll get some feedback from you folks on, on what's important in your particular market. So uh, without further ado, let's get started. And um, so we're gonna do our little introduction module here. So um, I must tell you that the slides that we're gonna talk about today are an offshoot of the in-person power monitoring that or power monitoring seminars that we formally did uh, before COVID and we hope to resume pretty soon. So um, we're taking little segments of those and presenting them virtually to you. So uh, the first one is uh, what is electrical power measurement and monitoring? And this is really important to talk about. And, uh, really, it depends upon the recipient. It depends upon you and what your expectations are because it can mean different things to different people with different applications. So a little more specifically, uh, measuring, what is that? And it's important to know that's really real-time instantaneous readings. You know, Think of these devices like a panel meter, a, uh, most multimeters that may not be recording devices. You're taking a measurement and that's it. It's gone. You know, It's changing. You have to jot it down if you're interested in it and recording it over time. Where monitoring typically means the device you're using has some form of memory and you're recording those parameters over time. So you're, you're possibly trending that over time, whether it be a voltage or current, power, harmonics, or anything like that. So um, there are very subtle differences, but they're extremely important in the types of tools that you need to do power monitoring. So when we look a little bit deeper, what is measuring? It's really instantaneous readings. We're doing spot checks of voltage and or current, depending upon your capabilities. Um, you're gonna measure voltage and current, and maybe 
you manually or that meter will compute basic power parameters like watts, VA, bars, power factor, things like that. So we're talking for power flow at that particular point. Now, when we talk about monitoring, things change just a little bit here. So uh, when you're monitoring for electrical energy or power, you're recording these parameters over time. So my, my volts, my amps, my watts, my VA bars, power factor, think of you know, what the, uh, the energy meter is doing on the side of your business or your home. Uh, it's accumulating that information so you can be billed at a later date. So really that's the accumulation and recording of those parameters over time. And the focus is how much energy you're using or how much power. What's the cost, where and when are various things that we talk about in that realm. Now, when you talk about power quality, and this is part of the distinction between the two, <clears throat> excuse me, that we'll focus on a little bit later, you're, you're still looking at voltage, you're still looking at current, but you're looking at it kind of through different filtered lenses, and there's a different application involved. So you're not as much, consider, you're not considering as much as how much you're using, but what's the quality? You have sags, swells, transients, fluctuations in the supply. Um, current variations, they're treated similar to voltage, harmonics, distortion in the power supply. And overall, the, the question is, what's the compatibility of the power source to the load? I've got a power supply, maybe the utility, and is that good enough to support the loads that I'm going to plug into it effectively? And really, it's about your susceptibility, your uptime, and the economics effects of any particular problems. And the thing is, your application may, inv may involve one or more or both of these uh, these uh, different sorts of usage and applications. So again, what are the different types of power monitoring? You have energy, and that again is how much power you're consuming. So you're talking about power quantity, all right? How much, what's the flow, demand, energy? Uh, what's it costing you? Where are you using it? Opposed to power quality is how good is the power? And there, there's a overlap occasionally, but again, you're looking at different things. Can my power supply, a power have reliable power for the loads that I'm going to plug into it. And what is that compatibility? And of course, today in 2021 and for the last 10 or more years, there's a lot of applications that combine the both of them together. So, and you can see some examples of different types of metering, panel meters, these, this is an energy logger, and this is a full-fledged power quality meter that can handle um, some or all of these types of applications. So what are the, the distinct differences between energy and power quality measuring devices? And these apply to whether you're talking about, if I go back to slide, kind of a panel mount or fixed meter or something portable. There's some fundamental differences, even though they're still measuring voltage and they're all measuring current. So energy and power quality measurements uh, requirements may overlap, but they have different resolution and accuracy needs. And that uh, therein lies the difference between the types of metering needed for the application. So for energy, it's typically measured in seconds. Yes, you can measure energy at a faster rate, but that's usually for uh, experiments and laboratory type things. But when we talk about how we get billed in commercial, industrial, or residential, that's a slower type of measurement. But high accuracy is needed, certainly if it's for revenue or billing purposes. So this is where some of the revenue standards come in um, when we talk about energy monitoring, you know, to certify an energy meter. And we'll touch on that as well. Power quality is a little bit different. I mean, the susceptibility of the power supplies, the computers, the devices that we plug into the power source, well, that susceptibility can be in microseconds and in milliseconds. So your metering needs to be capable of detecting these sorts of changes. Um, so these are fairly fast changing events or, or, or switching in the power or the load uh, or in the supply that can affect your load. So again, your metering is important to be able to capture that. So Typically measurements are in microseconds or in milliseconds, um, and a high accuracy is important, but not required. And that's the key. You're normally not concerned about high accuracy in the power quality realm. However, many of today's PQ instruments, uh, certainly some of those we're gonna talk about as far as the standards that are supported, do have revenue level accuracies, which are usually a half a percent, 0.1%, uh, something like that. Um, but a big distinction is that a PQ instrument can often be used for energy surveys, but not vice versa. So when you think about it from a common uh, sense perspective, if an energy meter had power quality capabilities, they probably call it a power quality meter. So uh, I'm not advising you to choose either one of these, just make sure that uh, you choose the right tool for the, uh, the application and the job that you have in front of you. 
So again, um, the difference between energy and power quality, where is energy used? The, the cost compared to billing, that's an important thing. Is your utility bill correct? Um, identify and quantify areas for reduction. I'm on an energy savings program. These are important things. And, and of course, ongoing energy management. You know, I've made, maybe you've made some improvements to your um, lighting or other things. Well, is, does that perpetuate over time? So ongoing uh, analysis and measurement is important. And for power quality, you can often evaluate the compatibility between the power source and the loads uh, and troubleshoot, determine the cause and effects of problems. So I had a particular device or system go down. Why did it go down? Was it even power at all? Uh, things die and software locks up and uh, hardware fails unrelated to the power. So uh, we'll talk about that a little bit more. Uh, determine the impact of power quality on your facility costs. So not only am I having a problem, well, there's a cost to that problem. My facility went down, hypothetically. How much is that costing that or per event? And that may go to the, the uh, payback on uh, mitigating that particular problem in the future. And of course, uh, determine the need and properly select mitigation equipment. So I've identified a problem. I have harmonics, I have a voltage problem. Um, well, can I get payback on that? And how do I size that mitigation uh, uh, information or that mitigation equipment appropriately? Or you may have both simultaneously. Again, there's a lot of metering, including uh, our PQ meter here, one of them that can do both simultaneously. So what types of power monitoring are we talking about? And I'm not talking about energy versus power quality. I'm talking portable instrumentation and the distinct differences between that and fixed instrumentation. There is some gray today, but there, there's some black and white differences that will help you choose the right tool for your job. Um, so what are the differences? Well, portable, usually you're reacting to a problem uh, for a portable application. And this is an example of both of these are example of portable meters. They're handheld. Um, typically your application has a single or a few meters uh, and is temporary. So really what that means usually is that there's banana jacks, alligator clips or crocodile clips, some temporary voltage connection, as well as temporary current connections with uh, maybe flexible CTs like, like you see here, or clamp-on CTs. And we'll compare and contrast that to fixed uh, monitoring in a few minutes. There is a trend for strong communications. Even though um, these instruments are typically installed temporarily, uh, communications are, are very important uh, to help make more of an optimal measurement and a safe measurement. If you don't have to physically touch the instrument uh, once it's set up, then that's a safer environment for the user. So. Uh, as an example, these are installed in fairly dangerous locations and proper PPE and safety precautions need to be taken to install them. And if you need to change a setting or offload data uh, during your survey, it's best to communicate remotely to it so you don't have to open up those cabinets and safe the environment and safe yourself for that. So there are benefits. Um, usually in the portable world, desktop application software is used for the data review. So uh, the meter is deployed in the field. Uh, you either remotely or manually pull out the data and then you run it through the software um, for reporting and, and analysis and, and whatever else you're trying to get out of that. Now, when you compare and contrast that to permanent uh, systems, usually it's, a, it's for proactive needs. You've had the need or the desire to protect your facility. Certainly, if you're talking about energy, um, maybe you want to do ongoing cost analysis and, uh, you know, compare to your utility bills and things like that. And maybe for power quality, I want to make sure my power system is working optimally, that whatever protection devices are protecting me, and also have the ability to uh, reactively go in and understand what happens should a problem occur, okay? Uh, and again, these are for permanent use. It's installed from the life of the facility. And you can see some examples. There's a panel mount meter, a DIN mount meter. You can see the CTs. This is a donut CT. Um, this is a fixed installed CT at um, a... Um, one that'll open up at the top here and, and let you put it into a hot circuit. But the point is, these are all connected directly to your meters and are installed permanently as well as your meters. And uh, basically you have a system with multiple meters of different types, uh, some energy, some power quality or both, depending upon your needs. They're typically panel mount or rack mounted uh, permanently into a substation, into a piece of switch gear or whatever's appropriate. And most importantly, to compare to the uh, portable meters, the wiring is typically permanent. So you have a wire uh, coming into the meter and screw terminals to connect your voltage, your current, and other measurements that are going to be done. And those are directly connected to any CTs 
and or PTs, potential transformers that you may be um, uh, monitoring, okay? Um, for fixed applications, well, uh, you're not in front of the meter, so there is strong communications. And so what that means is that there's usually a server somewhere that's automatically in the background getting data from your metering. In a modern world today, that's typically via ethernet connections, uh, can be via cellular connection, which I actually have set up in my office here as a test. Uh, can be RS-45, so older technologies, but this software is in the background automatically communicating with each meter, so it's keeping a database in uh, in the software that you can go browse proactively or even reactively should something fail. All right, these are applicable on substations, industrial applications, data centers, anything that requires PQ and or energy uh, analysis, all right? So the, uh, the applications are wide open. There's no uh, one that's better or worse. You may choose a little different meter for utilities versus industrial, but these concepts still apply. So if you look architecturally, um, a fixed system is a little more complicated, of course, than uh, just deploying a, a single uh, portable meter, as we saw before. And architecturally, uh, you would have a, a piece of software running on a server, running on a computer um, in a simple case, and that's really just going out over a network, which can be your building's network, the internet, a LAN or a WAN type environment, communicating with remote meters deployed, putting the information in the database and making it available to the users. Uh, these days, using just a web browser um, in an older system, it could be desktop application software. So you would have multiple computers uh, interfacing. And this is just an example of a SCADA-like environment um, that we can provide. And basically it's putting a nice user interface. I know this is a little tough to read, but this is a one-line diagram of the particular facility with different metering points overlaid on top of it. So in summary, <clears throat> what are the benefits of power monitoring? And certainly some of this is uh, proactive and reactive, but problem avoidance um, and case studies have shown that being proactive can increase the reliability and uh, basically prevent problems from happening. You, you can have the ability to see things starting to fail before they, they, they turn out to be an outage altogether. Okay, and this can be proactive on energy, it can be proactive on power quality. Um, this gives you the ability to understand your facility. Uh, if you don't monitor it, you can't measure it. So what's my energy utilization? Is it going up, going down? Why is it changing? Um, I put in energy saving stuff and that's deteriorating over time. Why? Uh, from a power quality perspective, uh, monitoring your, your levels, your voltage, your current, your harmonics, you may not have a problem today, but you notice that they're starting to get close to some limits or specs on some of your devices. And then more importantly, it lets you react certainly on a power quality basis. Should problems occur, you have, it's kind of like a DVR for your system. You are actively measuring. And if something happened last night at 3 a.m., you can go back and look at your trends and your events, what occurred last night at around that time to see if anything was recorded by your PQ monitoring system. And if it wasn't, well, what else could have failed? It doesn't always have to be a power problem, but Fingers typically point to the, the facility manager or whomever is responsible for the power. In lieu of anything else, any obvious evidence, people point, tend to point to power first and it's up to this uh, person for him or her to identify, hey, yes, it was a power problem, I'm on it, or no, we think it's a server failure or software issue or something else. And you could say, hey, the power was clean, as an example. So looking at the energy side of things, um, again, we're gonna look at some building blocks and. We are usually talking about three-phase circuits here, um, although there's certainly single-phase and split-phase applications. In industry, oftentimes, unless you're on individual loads, you're talking about three-phase. And the important takeaway here, we're gonna stay away from the math, is that if you want the total power in a three-phase circuit, do what the metering does. They add up each individual phase uh, and give you a total power. And what that means is balanced circuits are not really for the real world. Uh, you could be looking at individual motors or loads that could be balanced, but maybe they're not because they're not operating optimally. So make sure that you're looking at each individual phase and getting a total as the sum of all of your individual phases. Uh, we are talking about alternating current, so it does get a little more complex. Literally, there is complex arithmetic involved. Then this is versus just DC, you know, that uh, is actually becoming a, a sort of a niche in a lot of industries distributing via DC. But we're talking about AC and what does that mean? We have something called the power factor, which I'm sure you're aware of. And that's the angular difference between the voltage and the current. 
And what that means is that, you know, on a resistive load, you have a power factor of one. On an inductive load or a capacitive load, you have a power factor of less than one. Can't go higher than one. And in the, the industry convention that we use is that a power factor with a plus sign or no sign at all is really implied to be inductive, where a, a, a power factor with a negative sign is capacitive. Theoretically, it can go the opposite way, but that is really what's happening in industry. And uh, that's the way that we perceive things and the way we treat things in our industry. And just looking at it visually, you have the voltage and the current, and you can see here's a resistive load. Voltage and current line up on top of each other, and this is really an easy point where they cross zero. See a nice AC waveform, this could be 60 hertz like most of us use, or you can you know, beam yourself over to Europe and it could be 50 hertz, it's kind of irrelevant. So you have a resistive load, you can see the voltage and current line up on top of each other, they're in phase, or an inductive load. So the current lags the voltage, and the reason being is that the physics of an inductor, the current can't change instantaneously, but the voltage can. So you can see here's the voltage, you can see some time later the current crosses zero because it's delayed by that inductance. And capacitive loads um, are the opposite situation. So the current leads the voltage because the voltage can't, can't change instantaneously in a capacitor. So going back to our basic uh, uh, circuits classes, this is the kind of the physics behind what we're talking about. Uh, the good news is that the metering measures all this for you and kind of does this basic math and what we see is the power triangle where here's the watts, which is the um, power including the power factor, if we call it, the power factor ideally should be zero, where watts equals VAs, and the VARs, or the wasted energy, uh, ideally should be zero. However, when that this angle grows between the voltage and the current, you gain VARs, and those are losses in the system. This is kind of what power factor penalties that utilities charge and reason for other mitigation devices in the system. So. We won't kind of review the math here, but the whole idea is that this VA and VARs are the same. That's the best you can get. That's a power factor of one. When the power factor goes down, and in this case maybe it's more inductive, you can see this angle increases. And that's, you don't want to have that. You want to manage that, okay? Now, demand and energy, um, what are those as parameters? <clears throat> Excuse me, demand, well, that's usually measured in kW or watts. Yes, you can have microwatts, you can have gigawatts. Usually we see KW, and that's the amount of power used over a particular period of time. And that's usually called the demand interval. And that's typically 10 or 15 minutes, something like that. Um, there's sliding intervals, it gets a little more complicated, but that's the minimum time that uh, power is accumulated over that time. And there's also energy, um, which is the accumulation of uh, power and demand. Usually also measured in KWH because we're talking over a period of time in H is hours, so that's kilowatt hours. And that is the accumulation of power, that's your consumption. And you can relate this to the old garden hose uh, um, analogy where uh, the energy is basically um, the rate that you're filling up the bucket, okay? How fast is that water coming out, maybe in gallons per minute um, would be a, um, uh, an analogy to that. Um, so when you look at a quick case study about our facility here in Dranitz, and we're in uh, Edison, New Jersey, just a stone's throw uh, from New York City, um, you can see this is our service entrance, and we've had this trend look the same for many years. This is the energy accumulation over a one-week interval, and this is the demand over that same week, and they're stacked in time over on top of each other. So um, we, we run a five-day-a-week, one-shift um, uh, load here. And uh, our manufacturer, we do manufacture in the same building as well as have development in, in, and um, everything else to support it. Um, so manufacturing starts roughly seven in the morning and goes home at about 3.30. And we have office staff that kind of overlaps that. And here is a Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and part of that Thursday. And you can see as uh, people start coming in on Monday morning, it ramps up to about midday goes down in the evening, and you can see this, I believe this was in February, so this is probably the heating system turning on in the middle of the night. You can see it basically repeats. Here's the weekend, we're basically flat for the weekend. Um, no one's probably in the building during that time, and that cycle basically repeats for our facility. So we have a very kind of predictable uh, sort of demand that we have, and really the challenge is, is lowering these numbers, and that's in an energy saving. What an energy consultant would tell me when they look at this information, you know, why is this, uh, like 90 kW or something 
over the weekend. Why can't that be closer to zero when no one's in your building? So, you know, little hints on what would happen during an energy survey or whatever. Now, when you compare energy, um, again, if you uh, go back to the old uh, dial meters on your, um, you know, for revenue meters, it's basically just accumulating. And what's that rate of acceleration of energy? And the easiest way to explain that, if you look at our demand, which is fairly flat over the weekend, look at that same period of time of, for the energy over the weekend, it's kind of like a constant glide slope for, for an airplane taking off. So I'm down on the gas at a particular rate, I'm, I'm basically accumulating the energy at a fixed rate. But look at what happens on Monday morning. When my, when my factory starts to light up again, you can see that constant rate goes up. You see, we have a little knee in that. And so our rate of accumulation goes up. During the evening, it flattens out again, and it keeps on going up. Again, that airplane getting a little more altitude than kind of you know, staying at that particular rate. So um, really, the energy won't go down unless I've got some sort of uh, alternative energy or I'm producing energy. And then you know, my, I would go into production mode for that. So you, it's easy to, get to understand, I think, when you understand what is the relationship between demand and energy? And there's a lot of information you can glean from this as well as to the, the consumption, the health of the facility. Also know what's going on in there. And without going into details, just because we don't have time, this is used as espionage in some cases where governments monitor embassies to look at what types of loads on a power quality basis, looking at the details of the power quality, but what is the consumption of those, of those facilities that you can get an idea what's going on in those just by looking at the power signature. Um, so it's, it's really a science in and of itself. So wrapping up the energy part, um, what goes into looking at billing and most of this is for utility aspects when we talk about a bill. And different utilities do things a little bit different, but typically, <clears throat> excuse me, there's a demand charge, an energy charge, you have power factor penalties that we spoke about before, um, ratcheting. And this basically means when you hit a particular uh, tier in your, in your bill, um, like you, maybe a power factor or a particular uh, amount of demand or energy, uh, we're gonna pay a higher rate. And like a ratchet can't go backwards, your rate won't go down until that bill or that billing period resets. Um, you could have fuel surcharges, stranded costs, uh, at least here in the United States, that's uh, investments in the uh, utility infrastructure that utilities have. Uh, delivery charges, the charge to basically put that stuff on the wires and get it to you. And you could also have, um, uh, multiple providers of electricity. In other words, someone you're buying energy from and the distribution company that you're actually getting it, those wires coming in your building. So you're gonna have multiple bills. So all these go into understanding your energy costs. So when we talk about uh, uh, revenue metering standards, we're, we're not gonna really get into this in any depth. Uh, really the standards that you follow or the metering follows varies uh, based upon where you're located. And, Maybe we should ask towards the end what you guys follow in Canada. In the United States, uh, ANSI, the American National Standards uh, Institute, I think it is, uh, it's the code for electric metering, and there'll be ANSI C12.1.20, uh, and other um, basic certifications that are required. Um, they're managed by each state in the United States, and but uh, meters are certified to those standards. Uh, very similarly, the IEC, the International Electrotechnical Commission in Europe, has similar but different standards that are followed, 62052-11 um, and 53-11 uh, uh, and 53-22. Uh, and they apply to different types of meterings. And some countries have localized requirements that may take, uh, specifically in Europe, parts of these IEC standards and they put their own uh, additional requirements on top of that. And um, so there's applications typically for revenue meters and not for spot checks or for references done by most users. So these are absolute requirements if you're gonna bill, um, but it, does, it means that if you're using it for reference measurements, you wanna have accurate instrumentation, but it does not have to comply with these requirements. And these requirements go past the meter itself. They go into the environment and the types of CTs and voltage pickups that you use. So these things are kind of complicated from a requirement standpoint. So the overall objective uh, in uh, you know, the difference between revenue certified and revenue accurate, again, revenue certified is looking at these issues and looking at the standards themselves. Revenue accurate really means that it meets the accuracy requirements of, of those standards that we talked about over there. 
um, and really want to define the performance requirements for the meters so that so compliant meters accurately and repeatedly measure according to the requirements of the job, right? And both ANSI and the IEC standards lay down those requirements based upon the meters, the transducers, the temperature, variations in power factor, and that all goes into it. But the important thing is that even though a meter may not be revenue certified by a lab, that it may have the accuracies of these types of meters and are perfectly good for spot checks and things like that. So, uh, but they don't require the revenue certification in these types of applications. So uh, it's an important distinction uh, to realize that you don't have to be revenue certified in many of these applications. So changing gears a little bit, and I know we're going a little fast, that's just because we're limited on time here today, but now let's give you a little flavor of power quality monitoring. Again, uh, energy is how much we're using, quantity, power quantity is what we're focusing on, and um, uh, power quality is not how much I'm using, which could be related, but how good is the power? And really a nice typical picture here to use is, what is a power quality problem? And really, the question to ask introspectively is, uh, do these waveforms present any PQ issues to you? So here's a voltage sag. This is a, uh, a, a transient. Maybe that's a power factor correction capacitor switching in. This is a peak transient. This uh, is distortion on the waveform that may be harmonics. This is a swell, which is an increase in voltage. And this is an, a, 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 um, a long duration under voltage situation or a sag situation recurring over time. And we'll define these parameters pretty quickly um, or in the next couple slides just to give you a flavor for them. But the key thing is, are, do these present a problem only if they cause equipment to misoperate or fail? So, you know, the, the takeaway is I can connect or you can connect uh, a PQ meter such as from Adranix to your circuit just because you see these things doesn't mean that you're going to have a failure. The important thing to understand is what is your susceptibility to these issues? So not that these sorts of waveforms were captured, but are you susceptible to them? So given the quality of the supply, do you have to worry about problems with your equipment and your, um, your systems and facilities? And really that's kind of comparing what happened to the specifications and uh, you know, the requirements of your facility. Uh, maybe you're perfectly fine, maybe you're on the edge, of exceeding a particular limit uh, for something that's critical in your facility. So what you what you also need to ask not only what your is your facility, but what is your economic exposure to these problems? So, okay, I've got a problem I've identified. I am susceptible to it. How much does it cost me to mitigate and correct that? So it's going to cost me X amount of money if I went down. What's the payback? Should I provide mitigation? So something simple. You just hit a reset button. You don't have any lost product, you don't have any lost wages, no big deal. You're not gonna invest much to prevent that from happening because not much pain was caused. But on counter that, if I'm a data center and I go down for an hour, well, I can't transact business for an hour, that's critical. So I've got a high economic exposure, so your payback is pretty short on mitigating those particular problems. So these are the things that you ask as users and um, the, the detectors of potential power quality issues. So when we start breaking things down, there are really two sources of power quality problems at a very high level. And uh, really it's the utility, and the other one is internal to the facility. We're not talking the equipment or the reasons why it happened, but you know, when you consider, when you look at the point of common coupling, uh, which is really at the meter, that's the, the kind of the interconnect between the utility, the energy provider, and you as the consumer, really it's upstream, which is the utility, or downstream, which is internal to the facility. And understanding which direction it came from is extremely important because something that came from the utility, other than putting in maybe a UPS or mitigating it, there's not much you can do about that. You have to speak to your utility. However, internal to the facility, that's your issue to resolve. Okay, so that's within your ability to go look at and analyze. Um, and then uh, one of the obvious questions is, well, who's responsible for most PQ problems? And we'd ask this out to a live audience if we're interacting here, but Really, it's the end user. Statistically speaking, roughly two thirds of the time, it's actually the end user in their facilities that are responsible for power quality issues. You know, that leaves that other third for the utilities, but, uh, and they're not infallible by any means, but what that means, it's typically us as the consumers of electricity usually 
we're the cause of our own issues and utilities will work with us to help resolve them and help identify what those things are. So this is probably the geekiest slide here that we're gonna talk about in our presentation. And this is about power quality measurement standards. Um, it's important to understand um, because there are some international standards and there are some changes in the standards and references that we've been using, which are important only because it helps you select the equipment that you're going to use. You don't have to be an expert on this on some of these committees, they get very, very complicated, um, but it's important being a consumer to understand some of this stuff. So uh, really worldwide, broadly, we have two standards bodies. Some countries do a hybrid of things, kind of like with revenue, but <clears throat> excuse me, you have the IEEE here in the US, which is the Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers, huge office is only like 15 minutes from here in Piscataway, New Jersey. These are US recommended practices for power quality, for harmonics, and for some other things. Internationally, we have the IEC, the International Electrotechnical Commission. Um, that applies to Europe, Asia, I think parts of Canada uh, would sway that way and prefer them. Um, and then you have some things specific to Europe and some other parts of the world. Um, now, just keeping this as brief as possible, um, at a very high level, what the recommended practices are in the United States or those who follow IEEE, some of them are rather, um, they're, they're not up to date. And the, pre the prevailing standards have come out of Europe. And the most important one that we see here is IEC 61000-4-30. And that's now in its third edition. And basically what that means, if you're Class A compliant, you have full compliance. And basically what the standard says, it tells us, like Dranitz and other manufacturers, how to build a power quality meter. And that doesn't mean what components we're gonna use or anything as far as schematically how we do it, but it gives us all the math to use to um, compute, you know, sag, swells, harmonics, flicker, and all these different things. And what are the, uh, the uh, accuracies and other requirements on that? And what that means is that if you're Class A compliant, you're fully compliant and you meet the, the requirements of that. Uh, and that has kind of superseded some of the things done by the IEEE. This uh, 1159 standard for power quality doesn't go to that level of detail. Uh, future revisions uh, uh, may, but there's a trend in the IEEE to harmonize with the IEC requirements. And really the rest of the world follows this 61000-4-30 edition three, and that covers harmonics and that covers uh, voltage flicker, which are kind of small changes in the voltage more in a utility perspective. And the important thing is the IEEE is harmonizing to some of these things, where this 519-2014, uh, and that means the year 2014 when that was released, it basically harmonized to the international measurement requirements and added some things to that, as they did for Flickr and other things. So we're getting closer and closer to worldwide acceptance of some of these PQ standards. Now, why should you care? Um, if you don't make these things or you know, you're not in the standards world, it's a lot of confusion, but these overcome an industry challenge of consistency and repeatability of measurement. And what it means is that there's an old time problem in the PQ uh, measurement industry, where you put two meters from two different manufacturers on the same circuit at the same time, and they'll come up with two different results. Uh, well, these the, the purpose of these standards, specifically 61,000-4-30, is to overcome that. So those two different meters will get the same results. And so really from a consumer perspective or a buyer's perspective, it's confidence in the instrumentation to appropriately detect and report the issues. Can you trust the data? That's what it all boils down to. Um, but the IEC methods are applicable in the US and any other country that we may apply, may, that may be interested in power quality or follow the IEEE norms without any compromises. You're not, you're not losing anything, you're gaining a, a trustworthy and reliable instrument that has repeatability of measurement. So most reputable PQ meter and instrumentation manufacturers offer compliance with these, what we call the IEC methods. And that's mostly that 61,000-4-30. And that applies to both portable instrumentation, that applies to both fixed instrumentation, both of course from Dranitz we fully comply and have been the first to comply with these things. Um, to the point where I said before, these methods from the IEC are now being harmonized or called out in the US and, and for those countries who also follow the IEEE um, methods, okay? Um, and also in other areas such as voltage flicker and harmonic methods, the IEEE is harmonizing or making the same 
uh, with these IEC requirements. And case in point, in the IEEE, and maybe part of Canada falls with this, there's IEEE 1547, which is for uh, distributed energy resources, solar, wind, and other alternative energy, and it interconnecting to the grid. And it's that point where it pushes power back onto the grid. And it's, it's, it's a standard for not only safety, but to make sure electrically uh, that there's no power flow and power quality issues. And they're using some of the, they're referencing some of these measurement techniques that we talked about before. So in general, uh, we'll just go through really quickly um, from the power quality disturbance perspective, and the names come from the IEEE, but what is a transient, an RMS variation, a waveform distortion, and there's these other things as well. So we're gonna just speak for a minute on each of them. And so we have a transient, and that's a short-term change. And this is where those microseconds and milliseconds come in that I was referring to. So this would basically be a spike that could blow something up. And this, even though this is called a negative transient, and a negative transient subtracts power um, from the load here, okay? And you can see a positive transient adds power energy. This can lock something up. So this would cause problems in power supplies. But you can see, to summarize, a transient is an abrupt change in this AC waveform. This would be that 60 hertz. Uh, wave shape that we'd look at if we plug it into your wall right over there. And there's various types, and we really don't have the time to go through those various types. But transients are fast changes to the wave shape that can blow things up and lock things up. And these are the reasons, or some of the reasons, why the PQ meters need to have a higher data acquisition rate than the energy meters. And then you have sags, swells, and interruptions. And think of these as your limits. Um, and although we look at the uh, RMS, the total RMS of a particular waveform, it looks like we're looking at peaks here, but it's a good reference. You can see a sag is a reduction in voltage, a swell is an over-voltage situation, and an interruption, it basically says voltage isn't there anymore. It's gone away, it's switched off for a particular period of time. So that's really the difference. And this line may be plus or minus 10% of what you need, or more importantly, what are the limits of the equipment that you're looking at? Maybe a UPS would have a tighter regulation than 10%, a couple percent, something like that. Maybe a, uh, something would have a wider regulation. So that's a little different way to look at it. So we're talking about reductions in voltage, increases in voltage, and voltage not there anymore, which is an interruption. Now, when we talk about harmonics, harmonics are really um, basically distortion. And I'm gonna just skip to over here. And you can see this is not a clean sine wave. That's a distorted sine wave. And the way harmonics work is that the generators of power, whether it be a traditional nuke, coal, or gas-fired plant, even to the newer alternative energy or distributed energy resources, they put very clean or fairly clean sine waves uh, on, the, uh, on the system. And they kind of look like these over here, nice pure sine waves. Well, it's our loads that we plug into the system that distort these sine waves. And then the voltage and current start to look like this. They look ugly. And that's because our loads aren't consuming power in a linear way. So we're not consuming linear sine waves in power. A resistive load may do that, um, but there are a lot of loads out there that basically they have peaks requirements like switch mode power supplies used in our computers and a lot of our office equipment. Um, they draw power in peaks. So what that means is that the current draw of those systems distorts the current, but of course distorts the voltage because we're looking at a, a closed circuit here. So what happens to the current is seen by the voltage. So when we look at that, we need to manage these, uh, this distortion and look at the susceptibility of our systems. And there's requirements to not only measure it, but there's compliance limits on what's really considered a problem when it comes to that. And uh, if you look at harmonics, what's the definition of a harmonic? It's an integer multiple of the fundamental frequency. And what that means is that, you know, in the US and Canada, I'm putting out 60 Hertz, but there's other frequency components that are kind of overlaid on top of that, that, that really comprise this dirty looking waveform. And so the easy way to analyze it, analyze it is you take this complex waveform, the metering breaks it down into these individual components that give you a measured parameters to know whether you're in compliance or not. And the first harmonic is the fundamental, which is the 60 Hertz component, or maybe 50, if you live in another part of the world. The second harmonic is 120 hertz, two times 60. Third harmonic is 180, 240, and 300, something like that. If you look at it visually, you can see this kind of hypothetical, what we call composite waveform. It's made up of a certain percentage of the fundamental, 
with that third harmonic or 180 hertz overlaid on top of it, you kind of look at these and add them together visually, you get this distorted waveform in the real world looking something like this. So when should you be concerned about harmonics? Well, harmonics are typically considered a problem when they're always present. So it's steady state distortion. Any PQ disturbance may have harmonics, but they come and go very quickly. So it's the cumulative effects on your power system of this continual distortion and the effects on motors and transformers and ductive loads and in different things like that and the health of those devices. So any wave shape can have harmonics, but we're talking about those that are continually occurring. That's when harmonics are of concern. Then you have something called triplin harmonics, and they're important for neutrals, and that's why we monitor neutrals. Uh, what a triplin harmonic is multiples of three, the third harmonic, the sixth harmonic, and the ninth. The reason that's important is that they add in the neutrals. So what that means is your neutrals, your safety valve in your system that 30 years ago maybe didn't carry any current at all or not much, is now carrying you know, a lot of amperage on there. So now current, you know, uh, the, uh, the wiring for neutrals must be oversized, and there's a whole bunch of standards um, by electric codes to manage that. So they are carrying significant amount of currents, and that is a result of these harmonics that are on our main phases. So last but not least, when you talk about harmonic standards, and then we'll open it up to some questions, um, that has undergone some change, certainly if you follow the IEEE uh, in North America. Um, just to give you a little history, the IEC, which we spoke about, which is actually called out in that IEC 61000-4-30, has a standard called 61000-4-7. And it basically tells us meter manufacturers, well, how do we measure harmonics in the system? What are the standards and the windowing and accuracies and all that geek math? Well, in 2014, IEEE 519 was updated and took the measurement requirements of this and said, you know, the IEC had it right. You can use those same measurement requirements. But they added several different parameters to that, one called very short time harmonics and one short time harmonics. And, and those are harmonics measured every three seconds and those that are measured every 10 seconds or 10 minutes, rather. And basically, the, the, the culmination of all that is that this standard, 519-2014, defines limits and statistical requirements for both of these. And really, in, in the practice, it's at the point of common coupling with the utility. It's based upon your voltage level and your current level. What are the exact compliance limits? So you can hook up a meter such as Adranitz and you program it at a particular voltage level. It's going to take that voltage level, to measure the harmonics continually over time. And this is a week-long measurement and it'll give you a pass fail, um, in our case, either on the meter or on software, to say whether each individual harmonic and what's called your total harmonic distortion are in compliance with these IEEE requirements. And that's on a pass fail basis, okay? So you don't have to really understand all these details, but it'll basically do the work for you on a compliance basis. Um, and again, why are we doing this? Well, there's a whole bunch of applications that require the management of harmonics. So it does its compliance at the point of coupling um, with the utility for your particular application, even though they're used within facilities down to individual loads, but they also apply to the application of DERs, alternative energy, um, utility management, facility management, industrial management. And again, the intent is to manage harmonics at the interface point with the utilities because it is a shared responsibility. The utility doesn't want to see you reflecting harmonics on their system. And you, of course, shouldn't be getting harmonics inbound from the utility onto your system, which affects your loads and uh, sometimes the life of some of your transformers and your uh, motors and other things like that. So that's basically around the world with power quality and uh, energy monitoring. And that's really the end right now. Can we take any questions? That's perfect. Well, thank you very much, Ross, for the presentation. I know everyone, we covered a lot of different stuff, uh, probably you know a little bit of an information overload, but uh, it is time now for our Q&A portion. We have about eight to 10 minutes. So uh, it, it would be great if you guys take advantage of having an expert like Ross with us today to answer in any and all questions that you may have. A uh, quick note before we get, uh, get started in that, if you do have any questions that are product specific, uh, including pricing, availability, uh, buying, renting, anything of the like, uh, we're gonna encourage you to go to our website, itm.com. You'll find our list of products, 
pricing, availability, our rental section, all the specifications on all the different meters uh, that Drenance offers uh, for this type of uh, monitoring, as well as our contact information to get in touch with one of our technical specialists that can help you answer specific questions that you may have. Uh, so we did have a few questions that did come in throughout the presentation. Um, one is a little bit general um, based on uh, inspection and maintenance services and, and, and offered services. Um, customers would like to know, or a customer would like to know, what type of uh, events would they see more often if they're, let's say, going to visit a manufacturing warehouse as opposed to offering inspection in a hospital or a medical field? Um, it's an open-ended question because really there's no specific answer. Um, you have the ability to see every type of power quality event and all of those things. And uh, unfortunately, I don't have a good answer to that because it's a, that's why you buy a well-rounded meter because you don't know in advance what you're up against, certainly on a troubleshooting sort of perspective. And you should be prepared for everything because the susceptibility of those loads can be to any of those things and virtually any type of failure can cause different types of you know transients or rms events or even harmonics so you can go in looking for specific types of problems uh, based upon the information you're given you know this type of failure occurred well typically it's this type of problem um, but you never know that's the interesting thing about power quality it's very wide open in that regard that's a very good point, but I mean, in, in that in itself is a, is a great answer in, in terms of you know, always be prepared for anything. So yeah, that, yeah, exactly. Yes. Um, another question: Are there any certifications uh, for these types of power uh, power meters? Yeah, there, there actually are. Um, there's a standard called IEC six two five eight six. When um, when I mentioned that sixty one thousand dash four dash thirty, that defines, as I said, how we build a PQ meter. What's all the the math, the intricacies, not the components, but kind of like the algorithm, it's algorithms behind it. 62586 is a standard that says how to test a meter that was that complies with uh, 61000 4 30. So you'll see manufacturers, and I'll throw out that Dranitz is one of them, um, that actually provide a compliance certificate. And the 62586 breaks down into various types of measurements. Um, very similarly, the, the, the SAGs or the, uh, um, the SAGs or dips or over voltages, harmonic, flicker, other things, and it'll lay down the requirements or how to test and whether you passed or failed on that. And you'll see, you go to our website, you'll see compliance certificates to that. Okay, perfect. Um, let's see. So we have a question from Marius. Um, what... I mean, I don't know if we want to get into that specific, but we'll ask anyway. Uh, what is the best watt meter you would recommend, uh, for example, to measure the efficiency of an inverter? Uh, just for the power efficiency? I mean, that's a, uh, that's a little bit of a challenge because it's two measurements that you have to combine together. Uh, it, should the load be consistent, most of them will do it. Dranitz has a Dran expert, which is very good for that particular task, very cost effective. Of course, I'll push our products. Um, but uh, you know you have to take two measurements. Um, uh, hope the load is consistent, and one on the input, one on the output. You can draw that efficiency. Otherwise, you have to measure them both simultaneously. Uh, I'll do another push. Our Dranview Enterprise software gives you the ability to overlay that information on top of each other, so you could actually see not only from a quality perspective, but from an energy perspective, and do that math. What the difference is, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, quick reminder. Uh, we do have about five minutes left, so please get your questions in. Uh, we have another question in uh, from Arthur. Uh, do current solar inverters filter any power quality issues uh, when they pass through? I, I think it means pass through the mode. Uh, it's kind of a broken up question at the end, but I guess do solar inverters filter any uh, power quality issues? Well, they, they make an attempt to. Uh, they attempt to be a match to the system. Um, speaking of, of harmonics, they want to limit the, because uh, there's a lot of switching that goes on in an inverter. They want to filter that stuff out. Um, but, you know, when I mentioned that IEEE 1547, I didn't know there's IEC versions of standards like that. In fact, 1547 came from Germany originating, but that's the intent in, in the current version and future editions is to look at that because there's there's two things. There's Is the inverter as it's built working right but maybe something fails or deteriorates over time so it's not only the specs of a brand new factory fresh one 
is doing the job, but what's going on over time, that's the important thing because you're, you know, and utilities are important, are, are, are into that because they got to match power factor wise, reactive wise, reactance wise, and that's the health of their system. That's the product they're giving to their customers that may not be produced by them. It's produced by a third party company that puts this big solar farm up and plugs into it basically. So they want to keep tabs on that. Absolutely. Absolutely. So quick last reminder, folks, a few minutes left just to get your questions in. If we don't get them answered uh, during the presentation, either myself or one of my technical uh, specialist colleagues will reach back out to you uh, via email privately to answer any questions that come in afterwards. And don't be shy. Go to itm.com to find all our uh, all our ways that you can get in touch over the phone, via chat live on our website, as well as email. Uh, Alberto has a question. Um, he's asking if you can compare shunt sensors to inductive sensors and if there's any pros or cons with using one or the other. Um, by inductive sensors, I'm assuming Alberto's referring to like a clamp on CT or something like that. Um, I mean, the accuracy, first of all, a shunt is really for DC measurements. Is the, uh, uh, my knowledge is that's probably the best way to do it, um, most accurate way. However, there you don't, uh, you don't clamp on a shunt. So there's the safety and practical aspects of using that, that for a lab environment or something permanently installed, maybe a shunt is okay, but certainly something temporary where you want to clip on or you know have a rope CT or a Gowski, that's temporary, that's much safer to use in a lot of applications. So it, it's without more information, it's hard to more accurately answer the question. That's perfect. So Alberto, if, if you do have uh, you know a follow-up or anything to that, please, Either get yeah. it in now, mm -hmm. we're, we're getting a little bit close to the end of the hour, we want to respect everyone's time, uh, but Alberta, you can reach out to us privately uh, via phone, chat, or email as well. Uh, and again, if we don't get uh, get your questions answered, please uh, visit our website. And again, if you have any questions related to product pricing, availability, specifics, technical specifics for, uh, for a particular model or something that you're interested in, please, itm.com. Most of the information is going to be there. If you need a little bit of technical assistance, you can get in touch with any of our technical support staff and we can help you with that. Uh, let's see. Okay, we'll go last question. Uh, this comes in from Mark. Uh, is there a specific for how far away CTs uh, should be from other conductors? Uh, and he elaborates a little bit. Sometimes we have, uh, we have to jam them into a panel close to other circuits or phases. Do you have uh, maybe a... I mean, yeah, is there any sort of standard? Not that I'm aware of. I mean, you just, I mean, it's the type of thing you have to live with the environment that you have. So you really don't have a choice. Um, the important thing with CTs is that, more importantly, is that they're centered around the conductor as best that they can. And uh, when you, you know, certainly for a, an inductive clamp CT, uh, that's, uh, you know, that's hard to do as well. Uh, most people wind up hanging it on the conductor. But for a Rogowski coil, be very, very careful. Uh, the centering thing is important as well. That's all things, but you're going to have a coupler on a Rogowski coil where the two ends sort of come together. You don't want to hang it by that. That's the weakest part of it measurement wise, and you'll get the most error introduced into your measurement. So practically speaking, we tell people to center it and you, you, that's not going to happen, but don't hang it by that coupler. Uh, you'll, you'll be in for a lot of issues. Just rotate that. So that's aimed away or down or something like that. So that's practical advice I can give. I think, yeah, that's uh, it's definitely great advice. Uh, again, so we're going to respect your time. We have a little bit less than a minute uh, to the top of the hour, bottom of the hour at this point. So, uh, Ross, I'm going to thank you very much for the presentation today. Lots of information was passed on. Really, really appreciated uh, you joining My pleasure. Us. And on behalf of ITM University, we want to thank you for joining us and attending our webinar today. We hope you found it informative and helpful. We are here to assist you in any way. Please uh, visit our website, itm.com, for anything and everything you could possibly need. Uh, through ITM, uh, our website, you can find the, our entire list of Dranix products with descriptions, technical specifications, pricing, availability, data sheets, manuals, anything and everything that you can find. If you don't happen to find it on our website, please go to our Contact Us page. You can find our email, phone number, as well as connect uh, with one of our technical staff via live chat. At the end of this webinar, we're gonna have a very short survey for you to complete. We really appreciate your feedback and taking the time to complete that for us. It'll allow us to bring you more topics that are of interest to you uh, for our upcoming webinars. Speaking of upcoming webinars, we do have a few uh, in the coming weeks and months, so please check out the training section of itm.com for the full list of schedule, uh, scheduled 
webinars as well as the topics. And don't forget, as a thank you for attending to the webinar today, your name will go into a draw for to win $100 on your next online order. The winner will be announced on our social media channels, so be sure to check us out there. Ross, thank you once again for the uh, for the presentation, and we will thank everyone for attending today. We wish you a great rest of the day. My pleasure. Thanks, everyone. Take care.